Well, we have a, a very special guest with us uh, this morning. <laughs> um, our brother, Mark Lewis, he's um, one of the district executive people in our uh, denomination and in, in, in our division here in BC. And he's actually the assistant superintendent in charge of church revitalization. Am I getting that right? Okay, um, maybe I missed something. <laughs> Okay, but Mark has come here on my invitation uh, just to sit with our leadership and to discuss um, the direction that God would have us to, to go past this point. We've never been at this place before, and we want to do the work of God in, in, in this community, and we want to be a giving and a sem sending assembly, amen? We do. We want, to, we want to serve the Lord effectively, and um, there's lots of things we can learn, and, and I'm learning as your pastor as we go, and I know each of us on this journey, um, God wants to teach us new things, and he wants us to be effective out there um, to, to see our community, hear the gospel, and respond. That God wants us to share the gospel effectively out there. So to prepare for that, we need to be disciple makers here, right? Amen? Amen. So we're thankful for Brother Mark that he's come here from, from down in Langley. And uh, he's going to be our guest speaker this morning. So, Mark, if you'd just come and share the word with us. And let's just pray for Mark uh, before he shares. Lord, I thank you for my brother. Thank you for Mark, Lord. And God, as he brings us a message um, from your heart, God, we just pray that you would help him to expound on the word and farther that our hearts would be open to hear what it is that your spirit would say to us this morning. Lord, we know that there's so many things that you have in mind and we want to glorify you, Lord, and I just pray that you'd glorify yourself through this message and that you would draw people to you. And, Lord, if there's anyone here that needs to get things right with you and needs to, uh, to consider things, God, we pray that our hearts would be open to that. And uh, I thank you for my brother, that he's come up here to help us, and um, pray your blessing upon him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Clint. Um, I'm going to clear a little space here. Uh, because I'm at that age where I'll just bump into things and fall over. And I see this glass of water here, which is definitely could put you in the front row there in the shower zone if I kicked it and booted it over. So let's move maybe that back a little bit too. Well, Hillside Church, good to be with you this morning. You're all okay? You're all doing all right? Well, that, that really didn't convince me. I don't... <laughs> Are you doing okay this morning? All right. You're excited to be in church? Oh, good, good. Well, I had a fantastic time last night with your leadership team and board, Pastor Clint. Um, as he mentioned, uh, my name is Mark. Uh, I am the Assistant District Superintendent for the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada here in British Columbia. Um, my role, uh, I get the wonderful privilege, the honor to be able to travel. We have 211 churches in British Columbia. You are one of those PAOC churches. I get to travel throughout the province visiting our churches. Um, hopefully being able to help resource and equip and encourage our churches to become healthier, more vibrant, fulfilling their mission and vision. Uh, and it was great being with your team last night. You got a great leadership team. Uh, it was a fantastic evening of kind of uh, just getting to know each other a little better and spending some time kind of dreaming about the future of Hillside Community Church. And um, if you didn't know this already, you are a healthy, growing church. Amen. That's exciting. I get super excited about that because I was telling your leadership team last night that in a lot of the churches that I visit, the reason I am visiting there is to help them because they are not a healthy growing church. They are kind of plateaued or declining or, or, or things are just slowed down and we're trying to figure out ways to help them become more vibrant and passionate, reaching their community for Jesus. Last night, your leadership team, I was able to express to them, as I am this morning to you, that it's exciting to be able to come to a church that's doing well, that's growing, that's healthy, that's vibrant. You have a fantastic pastor. Amen. You can just wrap that up a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Pastor Clint is an amazing guy, and it, and it was so good to see just uh, how he leads his team last night. I... Um, I've been a pastor now for 33 years. I've pastored all over uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, the Lower Mainland. Uh, I was telling the team last night, I even spent 13 years in Las Vegas as a pastor. Um, you know, in ministry, if your job is to try and help the sinners find Jesus, we might as well go to the heart of where it's happening, right? 
So it was an interesting experience down there. Uh, I've been back up here in Canada for five years now. Uh, I was a lead pastor in the Vancouver area for uh, a couple years, and then I've been in this role in the district now uh, for three years, and it's been a tremendous, uh, tremendous experience. Um, there's a, you guys get the little PowerPoint that I sent you? Yeah? Oh, there we go. Uh, let's go to the next page. I am uh, happily married, have a wonderful wife. That's my wife on that side. Her name is Carrie. Uh, and I have two beautiful children, and I just gained a daughter-in-law this year as well. This is my uh, son, Canyon, on the right side there, and his new wife, Tessa. Uh, Canyon and Tessa are worship pastors in Kelowna at uh, the house church there. Uh, and then beside Tessa is my daughter, Esther. Esther's 28 years old. Uh, she is, lives with us. She has a special needs uh, syndrome called CHARGE syndrome, which I would, if there's nurses or medical people here, we could sit down and talk, but CHARGE stands for something that I forget all the time. She has symptoms of autism and Down syndrome, but she is a joy and brings huge, tremendous joy in our life. Uh, actually, um, she often travels with me, her and uh, my wife Carrie uh, weren't able to come this weekend, but uh, they're back at home. And I told them, Pastor Clint, can you hand me my phone? Because they weren't able to be with me, I'm going to do a, a real dad moment here. I'm going to take a selfie of all of you with me. Is that all right? Because they're always like, what was the church like? And what were the people like? And what did it look like when they don't get to come with me? So if you'll bear with, just give me like a dad moment here for a second. All right. Pastor Clint is awesome. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Good. Oh, tell them that you actually really did convince me of that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, sometimes they get to travel with me, and um, this unfortunately this time they didn't, but I'm sure we'll be back another time, and they'll be able to come. Um, today is actually the anniversary first year anniversary of my son and daughter-in-law Tessa's uh, wedding. And so I actually have to leave right after this to get home to an anniversary celebration dinner. Not that I didn't want to stay and have lunch with you, Pastor Clint, but celebrating the kids, you know. We got we to gotta do that kind of thing. So anyway, one of the things that we talked about last night that I try really hard to encourage uh, and deal with uh, and talk about with our churches is uh, when you get to this place as a healthy, growing, vibrant church, we talk a lot about things like mission and vision and values. And your church has a tremendous statement, a mission statement, a vision statement. Um, we truly believe with all of our PAOC churches that we share the same mission. That's to live out the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all people. Amen? And, and your church does that. Personally, we live that, that mission uh, statement out through the Great Commandment by loving the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, and our mind. Um, and the unique vision that you have as a church is how you live that out here in your community. Well, when we talk about those things, one of the things that always comes up is those are very lofty, beautiful spiritual ideas. Making disciples and seeing people come to Jesus. As passionate Christians and followers of Christ, we want to we love God with all our heart. We want to love him with all our mind and all our soul. But what does that look like every day? That's actually the struggle, right, that you and I have to walk through every day. What does it look like to our community for us to live out being passionate followers of Jesus in everyday things? When you're standing in line at Freshco, when somebody cuts you off in traffic, when you don't get the things that you always wanted to get, or when you're frustrated, or when you're angry, in your relationships, when there's conflict, or when there's trouble or struggles or trials at work, what does it look like then to be a passionate follower of Jesus. And there's some great encouragement that comes in, in Philippians chapter 2. And I want, if you've got your Bibles today, I'd love for you to turn there with me. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles and you're one of those very hip, young, kind of cool people and you got it on your phone or on your tablet, awesome. Any of you people here? Look at you, hip crowd. Wow. I'm still old-fashioned. I still love the kind of leather and paper in my hand, so I'm going to read out of, the, out of that today. But um, yeah, let's turn to Philippians 2. We're going to have a look at Paul gives us some, I think, really encouraging words about how to actually practically live out our life so that we are a tremendous representation of who Jesus is in our community. Um, so Philippians chapter 2, let's find that. It's a long passage. Bear with me today, but we're going to read it together. It's never a bad thing spending some time reading God's word. Amen? 
All right, let's read this together. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather... In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God then exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue would acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, and I love Paul's encouragement here to us, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Verse 14 says this, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and a crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. What beautiful words, what challenging words from Paul. And the reality of it is we could probably take weeks diving into every one of those things that he challenges us with on how to live a Christ-like life. But I want to look at three, I think, that are incredibly simple Bits of wisdom today, yet they seem to be such great challenges for us to live out every day. Let's look at how he opens up that chapter and starts talking to us. He says, look, if you, if you want to be people who live like Christ, if you want to be this example to the world, the very first thing you need to do is work on bringing unity and not division in every relationship that you have. That's a great challenge. Whether it's in your home life or your work life, whether it's in this building here at church or outside of this building, Paul comes along and says, bring unity. That's what the believer needs to do. Set aside your wants and desires and passions to get your own way and instead put unity and, 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 and harmony in the first place. It's interesting to me that, that Paul starts with this. Because it looks like even back in New Testament times when people were actually the closest to actually possibly seeing or even hearing Jesus speak in person, this was still a struggle amongst them and in the church. There was still division, disunity, disharmony in the church. The sad reality is that all these years later, it doesn't seem like we've actually learned a whole lot. It's sad because the truth is, We actually, many of our churches struggle with this same thing where there's division and disruption within our churches. Look at the last two years, and by no means do I want to dwell on this, but look at what has happened in our churches. I can tell you as I travel all those 211 churches throughout this province, in 33 years of ministry, I have never seen anything bring more division to churches than what has happened in the last couple of years. Church should be about love, a grace, forgiveness, unity, acceptance. And yet, sadly, what happened over the last couple of years showed the world that the church, even in its position, was a place that you walked into and what you had was political d- division and discussions. What political party do you support? What political party do you support? Do you agree with my opinion on this issue or this issue or this issue? How do you feel about vaccines or masks or gender issues? And all of these things were pushed to the forefront when the reality is what we should have been supporting was harmony and unity under Jesus. The truth is, and Paul brings this to a very clear point, if you and I want to live like Jesus and be an example to the world of who he is, we need to be people who bring unity and not division. That's a good amen spot. 
I gotta tell you this, I wanna be honest with you today. 13 years pastoring down in the United States, my congregation was predominantly Hispanic and African American. So there was a whole lot of, amen, preach, come on. Come on, pastor, come on. Now I know here at Hillside, we've got a little more conservative. You know, some Mennonites, some Baptists, you know, the, the, those, how, many, how many, you know, kind of traditional Baptists do we got kind of that are historically here? A few? No? Got some Mennonite brethren here? Dig deep, Mennonite brethren. I want an amen. I want an amen once in a while. And a, Come on, pastor, okay? It's just going to make me feel like I'm back at my home church in the States, all right? It's all right. Verse 2 in Philippians in chapter 2 challenges us with this. Look what it says. It says, then make me truly happy. I, I love how Paul there's a, there's a sense here. He starts out with this very pastoral kind of bringing the family together. He says, look, I'm the guy that planted this church. And I've loved you since the very beginning. And I've cared for you. And he says, so make me truly happy. If you could do that, please, by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. What a beautiful idea that is. But Paul recognizes back in New Testament times, and it's a challenge for you and I today. It's the same thing. The world needs to see a church that is unified, not divided. The world needs to see a church that celebrates harmony and forgiveness and grace. It doesn't see a church that draws lines in the sand and divides and breaks up and has disharmony and disunity and division. If we are going to live like Jesus, then we must unite people around biblical truth and not divide them on social issues. Come on. <laughs> By the time we're done today, I will have you being an African-American gospel church. We will. Sadly, it seems, though, that the church today, we have struggled because we have become stubborn. We've become intolerant and unwilling to forgive. And what should set us apart as followers of Christ is our ability to be loving and understanding and unifying. Paul points out that this type of division isn't a, a social issue. It's not actually a political issue or even a relationship issue. What this is, he says, is a heart issue. If in our hearts we're easily offended or unwilling to forgive or holding a grudge, this just leads to disunity and, and division. And, and what kind of example of Jesus to our world and our culture is that? I know that you have a pastor that believes in the power of God's word. And I know that as a congregation, you read your Bible. When you go back in that Old Testament, when you look through the New Testament, particularly you see the life, that example that Jesus gave of how he interacted with people every day, whether it was the synagogue or the marketplace, whether it was on a hillside or in a garden, we see that Jesus' character exuded a couple of things. The first one was this, Jesus always thought of others above himself. We see it over and over again. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 challenge us with this. You must have this same attitude that Christ had. That though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. He was the creator of the universe. But in nowhere do you see in the New Testament that he used that to get what he wanted or to get his way. In fact, we see the opposite. In every interaction throughout the New Testament, Jesus always put the needs and the wants of others before his own. That's what it means to bring unity. We also see that Jesus' life was characterized by sacrifice. Never did he use I am God to get his way, but instead he sacrificed himself over and over again. If you come back into the beginning of the New Testament, into the book of John, John 18 is a powerful, powerful story. It's often looked at as chapter 18 is one of the darkest and gloomiest, most foreboding stories in the Bible. It is the moment that Jesus was captured and betrayed. And in that moment, if you read throughout chapter 18 of John, you see that men with torches and weapons surrounded him in the garden. They were about to arrest him. And we know, as we have read through the Bible, that it is the beginning of this sad tragedy that's about to unfold. A betrayal, an arrest, the beatings, the crucifixion, and everything that is about to come to fruition. But look what he says in verse 4 of chapter 18. Jesus, 
fully realizing all that was going to happen to him, stepped forward to meet his accusers. Jesus fully realizing all that was going to happen to him. What a beautiful verse that is. And it lets us know that in that very moment when those people came with torches and weapons to arrest him and then we were about to see this horrifying events unfold, Jesus knew that that was coming and yet he didn't think of himself but instead stepped forward to make sure that those around him were safe. When Jesus was about to be arrested, to be put on trial, to be crucified, he didn't run, he didn't argue or bargain his way out. He knew what was coming and he sacrificed himself anyway. When we look at that verse and it says Jesus fully knew all that was going to happen to him, we need to dive into that for a moment. That means he saw every horrible action that was coming. He knew in that moment that his hands and his feet would be pierced with nails. And yet he sacrificed himself anyhow. He knew that people would spit on him and mock him, punch him and slap him and pull the beard from his face as he carried that cross through the city streets. And yet he stepped forward to face his accusers. He saw the beatings and the lashings that would bring him to within an inch of his life. He knew that his friends would desert him and eventually betray him. And yet he sacrificed himself. His thoughts were of others, forgiving them, loving them, and giving himself up for them. That's the character of Jesus that the world needs to see. Following Jesus, folks, living like Jesus means that everything that you and I do needs to bring togetherness and forgiveness and unity, even if it costs us. It means that we walk away in the lobby from that argument that you know you could win. It means that you hold back that harsh word that you know would put that person in their place. It means that you save that difference of opinion and you let love and forgiveness and unity be exemplified in your life. In the midst of this broken, hurting world, we need to be an example of that to show them who Jesus is. The second thing that Paul challenges us with us in this verse, he moves from this don't uh, bring, bring harmony and unity and he goes right into the next thing and he just jumps at it. Now, I, I want you to notice this. Again, he starts out very pastoral. He kind of starts out by bringing his relationship, and I'm the one that's loved you and cared for you, so make me happy. Please do this. But you start to sense a little change in the tone of his voice here. Because the next thing he says is, and he just jumps right, and he says, be humble. Now, yeah, bring unity, not division, but be humble. And it's interesting to me that Paul goes right from unity to humility. He focuses on humility. Why? Because Paul knew that the key ingredient to any relationship, any harmonious relationship, is humility. When there's friction and tension, when we both want to get our way, somebody has to be humble enough to step down to allow that relationship to flourish. Look at what verses 3 and 4 says, challenging us. He says, don't be selfish. Don't try and impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Now, we look at this sometimes and we think, boy, that's simple. It's easy. It is one of the hardest things for us in the human race to do is to be humble. Is anyone going to be honest enough and give you an amen on that? It is. It's difficult. Because when we know we're right, we want everyone to know we're right. And we don't, we're not afraid of it. And this is what Paul recognized in the New Testament church, and it's one of the things that I think has damaged us in our church world today. Humility is such a difficult thing for us to strive to accomplish. But you know what? There is a unique connection when you look through the Bible between humility and godliness. Let's have a look at a couple of verses this morning. When you go back in the Old Testament in Proverbs verse, chapter 3, verse 5, it says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your understanding. There's an inference there that you don't know everything. That we're not, it doesn't matter how wise you are, how experienced you are. The reality is there is a challenge that says in life we need to trust in the Lord. But so many of us move that to a secondary position and say, but I know, I'm experienced, I'm educated, I know what's going on. And everybody else should know that I know. 
And yet God challenges us here and says, it's me you should trust in. Humble yourself and lean not on your understanding. If you jump into the New Testament in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, it says, take my yoke upon you and let me teach you. Why? Because I am humble and gentle at heart. We're learning from the humility of who Jesus was. Proverbs 22, verse 4 says this, and I think this sums up the whole idea of what humility is. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Truly being humble, truly being humble today is seeing ourselves as we actually are. Every one of us, no matter if you've been a follower of Jesus for a few weeks or for 40 years, we are flawed, we are broken, We are helpless people in desperate need of a savior. When there's a challenge like that, that says fear the Lord or humility is the fear of the Lord. One of the things that I love is that this, this book is so often misunderstood. So many times the world views this book as a, a book of rules, a book of regulations, a book of hindrances that hold us back from living the life that we should, our best life. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is a book of promises. This is a story that is told to bring life and joy and vitality to our lives through who Jesus is in us. And and one of the things I love about it is it is filled with promise after promise after promise. God doesn't lay out guidelines for us without giving us promises. And in fact, when it comes to the idea of humility, look what he says. Come all the way back to the Old Testament with me for a moment into Isaiah chapter 66. And look at the promise that is tied to humility. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts. There is a confidence in that statement that God is saying to you and I, I will bless you. I will pour out love upon you, grace upon your life. I will bless you if you have a humble and contrite heart. Who doesn't want blessing from God? And in a pathway to receive that, God lays out such a simple thing. Let humility mark your life. That humility for you and I today means that everything we do in life, our feelings, our preferences, our opinions, should take a second place to what God wants in our lives. Amen? That kind of humility brings life, brings vibrancy to every church and every relationship. The third thing that Paul jumps on here, and again, his tone is changing. Bring unity, not division. Be humble. And then he jumps right in and hits us, I think, where it hurts the most. And he says, and stop complaining and arguing. I mean, he doesn't even cover this. It's not even a real pastoral kind of oration or or, or beautifully poetic. He just jumps in and says, stop it. Stop complaining and arguing. Verse 14 says, do everything without complaining or arguing. The word grumbling is used in other versions or translations. But notice what he says. Not some things. Not most things. Everything. Do everything without complaining or arguing. How many today are going to be honest enough to say that we just, that is a struggle. You walk into church on a Sunday morning. Yeah, it's a little too hot in here. How come, I don't think this pew is soft anymore. My coffee is really weak. Do you guys have coffee at the back? Who makes the coffee? I just love the people that make the coffee. Because, like, no matter what, you'll never be Tim Hortons or Starbucks. And, like, you just know everyone's taking a sip. And every third person will go, well, that was good. But the other two or three, like, this is weak. This is strong. There's not enough that, bless you. (laughs) But look at, the truth is, and there's reality to this. It happens every day when we come into this building. There's always something we're going to complain about. We're compl- there are regular everyday things. We could complain about taxes. We, could compl- we were complaining about the heat yesterday. I mean, people. It was just freezing cold two weeks ago. <laughs> but this is just something that, that, that Paul recognizes that we see that is just part of our human nature. And Paul is reminding us that this isn't a suggestion. It's about attitude. You bring the attitude that you have that you live out every day, whether it's in this building or outside of these walls, 
It's an opportunity to reflect the love of Jesus to the world. And if the world sees us as complaining, as arguing, as bickering amongst ourselves and within our relationships, what kind of example is that to them? This, this has been an elegant. There's one saving grace here. I believe that this has been part of our human nature for a long, long time. Like, even when you go back in the Old Testament, complaining, bickering, murmuring, grumbling, arguing is something that just seems to come natural to us as a people. Go all the way back and even look, look, look in the book of Exodus. The, the Israelite nation, right, in bondage and slavery to the Egyptians. Just a horrible life. Pharaoh trapping thousands upon thousands of them. And yet we see God work an incredible miracle in their lives. God takes them out of bondage, out of slavery, and brings them into freedom. Delivers them from that slavery. Parts the Red Sea. Provides for their every need. And the next moment, what's the first thing they do? Grumble. Complain. Murmur. Whine. They do all of those. You can put any adjective you want in there. And you would think that when we read those stories over and over again, that today we would walk into buildings like this or walk through life and in every relationship with joy abundant, never complaining, never arguing. It doesn't happen. It's an attitude. You would think that we would learn something after all these years, but we still complain. And yet we have some of the greatest gifts that God has ever given he sent his son to die for you and I. Yet we will still find things to complain about. He forgives our sins and our mistakes. And yet we will still complain. He gives us the blessing of his Holy Spirit to help guide us and empower us. And we will complain. He gives us a new purpose and a new direction in life. He hears and he answers our prayers. And yet we find it easy to complain. If we want our lives to be a witness of who Jesus is, Paul's challenge is stop complaining. I love how Paul takes these very basic and simple things. Bring unity. Be humble. Stop arguing, complaining. But he wraps this whole encouragement up with a beautiful word picture. In verse 15, he comes out, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. He says this, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world of crooked and perverse people. That is the ultimate challenge that you and I have to live a life like Jesus. Shine like stars in the midst of a dark world. You and I know this today, that our world is on a dark and slippery slope. The things that I mentioned earlier, political issues, social issues, gender issues, soji, everything. We are in bombardment of a way of life. Following God, living moral and upstanding lives is absolutely not the acceptable standard today. Our world is becoming darker, perverted, crooked, and broken, just as the Bible says. But we're reminded that you and I live in this world. It's everywhere around us, but we are not of this world. This world needs Jesus. It is broken, damaged, and hurting. And you and I can play a role in helping that world find Jesus by putting our life on display, by being shining stars, a beacon of light that points people to Jesus, not only in this building, but everywhere that you walk, in every relationship, in business, in home, at school, in your hobbies, we have this opportunity to follow Jesus by living like him so that the world sees a difference. Loving God with all our heart, all our mind, and our soul, making disciples, those are the big task. But every morning that we wake up, we have the opportunity to live life this way. Paul challenged the church in Philippi, and I believe he challenges us today with that same thing. Bring unity and harmony. Be humble. Stop complaining and arguing, particularly with each other, and let the world see a difference in your life as you shine like stars in this dark world. Can I pray with you this morning? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. 
Thank you for the promises that we find in it, promises that encourage us and edify us, that build us up every day. But I thank you for the guidance that it gives, Lord, to remind us every day of who we should be and what we should act like so that the world can see you in us. We all know, as simple as that might be as followers of Jesus, it is a struggle that we deal with every day. So today in this place, I ask that you would give each and every person the courage, the strength, the boldness to do just what Paul challenges us with, to live our lives like shining stars in the darkness. No matter what it costs us, no matter how difficult it is, that we would rise to that challenge that the world would see in us, how we act, how we talk, how we intervene with them. God, they would see you in us. Give us that ability, I pray, Lord that we might see this dark and crooked and broken world find hope because they see Jesus in us. I ask this in your wonderful name this morning. Amen.